My father, Dr. Lester Summerall, will never be accused of being shy or timid about the subject he tackled in his teaching series. Sex was a subject that few Bible teachers wanted to teach about in the 1970s, let alone broadcast them on television. But Dr. Summerall wanted to bring the sexual revolution in line with the Bible and created 10 lessons entitled 50 Things God Had to Say About Sex. In this series, he shares how sex is mentioned over 50 times in the scripture and brings to life the need to keep the laws that God created and ordained about sex. It's interesting and valid for today's world. Stay tuned. Dr. Lester Summerall presents the World Harvest School of Continuous Learning. It is a world video university of teaching presenting truth on fire. It is a school of pertinent truth meeting today's demands and tomorrow's challenges. The World Harvest School of Continuous Learning is anchored to the rock and geared to the stars. We seek to obey Christ's command to go ye therefore and teach all nations. World Harvest School of Continuous Learning is a dynamic outreach ministry of the Lassie Broadcasting Network. You can enroll in this unique school and study in the comfort of your own home or attend classes at any of our campuses around the world. The public marketplace is glutted with illicit sex. Rancorous voices are crying out and directing moral trends in our country. Today, lawyers are filling their coffers with gold as they debate sex problems. Judges who make non-spiritual decisions in court watch our homes explode. Psychology and psychiatry seek to settle an insurmountable amount of human agony. What our country needs is to hear what God has to say concerning sex. Is God overprotective with man about sex? Does God change his moral standards to suit our generation? Does Jesus still deal with the sex offenders? Come with us to the Word of God for the answers. God speaks forth strong and clear. Now, Dr. Lester Summerall. Thank you. We're glad to see you. This is a very special series of teachings that we've prepared for you in a nature setting, uh, and they are related to sex. And today's lesson is, why is God so protective relating, regarding sex and, and, and about sex? Why, why has God taken that attitude toward it? Uh, there are many other things, uh, sins, that God hasn't been so protective about as He has the matter of sex. This is the second of our lessons in this great subject, and we, we hope that you saw the first one and that uh, you will enjoy this one. The first one was called The Sex Drive, and this one is related to why is God protective uh, about sex. We read in our, in our reading for the day in the book of Proverbs, chapter 6 and verse 32, uh, these words. It says, Whosoever committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. Uh, he that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. A wound and a dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. Uh, it takes God to say strong things about anything, whether it's any kind of a sin or any kind of a good thing. It takes God to say the strong things about it, and this is a very strong saying. You really should mark this scripture and, uh, and, and very probably uh, <laughs> write it down, maybe make a plaque on the wall. I don't know. Uh, but it says, Whosoever committeth adultery with a woman liketh understanding. He doesn't understand what the world's all about. He just doesn't understand the purposes of life. He just liketh understanding. And it says, He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. Uh, you don't know this, the tears. More tears have been said about the transgression in the area of sex than, than everything else put together on the face of this earth. And there's no doubt about it. And it says, A wound, he'll become wounded in his spirit, in his, in his, in his soul. A wound and a dishonor. <laughs> and a dishonor. Think of David after 3,000 years, still living under dishonor because he stole another man's wife. After 3,000 years, mind you, uh, uh, it says, and a dishonor uh, shall he get. And it says, his reproach shall not be wiped away. Now, when God says a thing, you better believe it. His reproach shall not be wiped away. Uh, why is God protective about sex? Well, I suppose the main reason is he started it. God made this magnificent universe that we live in, and it's a very wonderful and beautiful universe. And in the first chapter or two of the book of Genesis, 
you will find that God, after he had created the, the magnificent uh, universe that we live, God says, I will make man in our own image. And the Bible says that he took red earth and he formed it with his own hands. The only thing that we have any record of God using his hands to make is man. Uh, he spoke, he spoke the, the constellations into existence. He spoke the star clusters into existence. But man, he, he, he formed with his own hands. And after he had made something in his own image, his own likeness, the Bible says you look like God. When you see God in heaven, he's going to have one nose, two ears, two eyes. He will not, won't be cyclops with one, with one big guy in the middle here. Uh, he will be just like you. you got that, that God, the Bible says that God made you in his own image and his own likeness. And when God had, had done it and, and, and looked upon it, it was very beautiful. And then the Bible says he breathed into the nostrils of this thing that he called man. The word man means red earth. That's the original meaning of the word man. Uh, I'm, I'm, excuse me, of Adam, uh, the, the red earth. And after he had created this Adam, uh, he breathed into his nostrils and he stood up. And God looked at him and was so pleased with him, the two went for a walk together. He had something like himself that he could communicate with. For love to be love, it must communicate love. Or other else, love dies. Love cannot be put in a jar and screwed down. <laughs> or it becomes nothing. Love is only love when it's in action. And, and so God is love, so God is a person of action. Uh, he's still creating. When we get to heaven, we'll find out that he, he has never stopped his great creative processes, and we will be able to be involved in them in that day. He walked with man, uh, and he soon realized uh, that this person that he had made uh, needed someone else like himself, that God was so far above him and, and, and so busy, uh, until he, he needed someone to live close to him. And so God is the one that said that man should not live alone, but that man should have a womb man. That's what the word woman means, a womb man. Very distinct from the Adam man is the womb man, that she would be the one that would bring into being lovely little creatures. Now, this was the desire of God. This did not come about as an accident. God said, I will permit, I will permit this, this womb man and this Adam man that when they are together, that they shall create another like unto themselves, and there shall be perpetual generations. Now, no other creature in the universe, archangels cannot do it. Regular angels cannot do it. No creature, no creature in all of God's creation can make an immortal soul except God and man. And so it's a distinctive, that a distinction that God laid upon him and gave him. Now, when he wished to create Eve, or the womb man, uh, he didn't start over again down in the dirt. He was the first surgeon, and he went inside and took a part of man very near his heart and created from that this helper of his called womb man and named her Eve. And so he had two on the face of the earth. And that is the beginning of, of, of the world of sex. And God loved it and appreciated it, and it's pure, and it's holy, and it's clean. And God says, all you have to do is to be restrictive about the use of it. And don't let it get in the dirt and get dirty. And don't, and don't let it become in any way viola, uh, uh, in a violation of my, of my moral nature. Do it right. You'll enjoy it. Do it good, and you will appreciate it. But do it dirty, and it will always be a reproach to you. Uh, that's what the Word of God told us here. And so uh, God created man, and then he, Adam, then he created Eve. And then he was, uh, <laughs> he created the first, uh, the first wedding ceremony. It was God that married the two of them. God put them together and said something about it when he did it. He says, before there were any other people, only the two of them on the face of the earth, God said, and a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Now, God said that. Uh, when there were no one else on the world except just Adam and Eve, nobody here, and no in-laws at all, God said that. Now, if God said it, it works today. When, you, when you're married, you're supposed to set up your own home. Uh, you're supposed to, to be under your own roof, and you're to leave your parents and to come together and create a home 
of your own and, and, and a stability of your own and to live there together as God says, and the two shall become one flesh and what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Did you know there's no court in the world, there's no judge living and no lawyer ever born that has any right to separate a man and a woman. Did you know that? <laughs> the, well, the Bible says it. The Bible says what God has put together, don't let man put asunder. So man has no right to put asunder what God has put together. And when you know that, it helps you to know how to live. So God performed the ceremony. God put them together. And when God put them together from that very beginning, he addressed himself to this great subject of sex. And here's what he said. He says, I have a commandment related to sex. And he says, this is it. In the Decalogue, which is the Ten Commandments, in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 14, speaking to his people, God said, and thou shalt not commit adultery. Now, when we commit adultery, that means we go to someone that we are not supposed to, and we commit fornication with them, and uh, we go through the sex act with them illegally, wrongfully and dirtily <laughs> and God says now you shouldn't do this and, and, and as I read to you in my text if you do it a wound and a dishonor will you get and the reproach will never be wiped away now if you know that God does have something to say about sex and that God is saying the proper things about sex then you won't get upset at God you'll just know that if you conform you live happily and if you do not conform, then you have sorrows, tears, heartaches, suicide. You have all kinds of mess when you don't conform to what God says that we should do. And so it was God himself that says, let us have a commandment. It's short, it's crisp, and uh, <laughs> it's easy to read. It says, thou shalt not commit adultery. And, and uh, let's, let's do what God says do, and we'll be a happy people. And then God uh, is protective regarding sex uh, because uh, it has to do with the destiny of nations. Uh, marriage is a social institution. It's not a private thing. It's a social institution. And uh, it defines mating relationships. And for the founding of a family, it binds together by protecting and rearing the progeny are the, are the children that come after it. And by doing that, it makes a society. And if you do it wrongfully, you don't have any society. You have like dogs running loose, everybody doing what he wants to do, doing his own thing. <laughs> but you don't have a society that way. You only have a society when these things are properly channeled. And when we don't properly channel them, then you have insanity. You have hospitals loaded with people that with nervous breakdowns. Uh, you have suicides. You have you have broken hearts. You have little children that are so messed up. They don't know how to think. They don't know how to live. All they can do is weep and cry and wonder why the world is in the mess it's in. It's in the mess it's in because we transgress against God's law. Now, the Lord wants us to know that marriage is cultural and has to do with a type of society that you will live in. And it's used to, def to define the needs of that society and especially related to the family circle. And when you break those laws that God has made, then you run into uh, destroying the culture of that society. America today is destroying its culture. Yeah, you better believe it. It's becoming something else than what it used to be. And it's not nice and it's not happy. It needs God. It most certainly does. All known societies in, in, the, in the history of mankind have imposed limitations on sexual relations. There is no society, however primitive, that hasn't done that. Now, there are, these, these are, are buried uh, from society to society. Uh, 
in a, in a king's family. They can, they can get married and, and spend a million dollars for the wedding. And I'd been to jungle weddings uh, where the, the boy only had on a G-string and the girl had on a little G-string with a little thing tied around her breast here. And before the people there and around the campfire there, uh, they, they, they promised to take each other for a husband and, and wife. And while all the others laughed and, 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 and enjoyed it, they danced in a circle for a time and, and went off to a little hut that he had prepared. It didn't cost anybody anything. Uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it, was, uh, very, it was very simple. And yet uh, those people would not have permitted that boy to touch anybody else except this girl. They wouldn't have accepted that girl at all if she had touched anybody else except this boy. And so there were regulations, and I was in the jungles of Paraguay among Indians that hadn't seen but very few white people in, in their total life. And so uh, many primitive societies very strongly safeguard the virginity of their young girls. The, the Arabs do until this day. The, the lady wears a veil, and, and the purpose for it is to, is to keep her from other men. Uh, that's just the one purpose for it. Uh, in, in the olden China, uh, the, the father and the mother chose the bride uh, for, for the boy, and, 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 uh, and they possibly didn't see each other much until the day that they were married. And the purpose for it was to, was to preserve this thing called purity. Just, just to don't, don't let anything run loose and don't let anything go wrong. Uh, let's do it right. Now, they weren't doing that according to the Bible. They didn't know anything about the Bible. They did it because they were humans, you see. And God put it instinctively in every society on the face of the earth that this is a thing that was to be protected. And so God is not overprotective. He just wants you and me to be happy. He doesn't want us to misuse the gifts of God. And if we'll do as God told us to do, we can have very happy lives. Uh, God uh, is protective in, in, our, in our relations with marriage. A marriage is a contract. One could compare it to the contract or covenant that God makes in the Bible when he makes the covenants in the Bible. Uh, you, can, uh, you can even compare it to the blood contracts in the Bible that through the offering of a lamb, sins are forgiven. The Lord Jesus died on the cross, his blood was shed, and that created the new covenant in, in the New Testament. And so it's, it, it's protective in that sex is a marriage covenant uh, that we, we covenant together. Now, once this covenant is given between a man and a woman, then it's irrevocable. I mean, it is for the rest of their lives. It's of a permanent nature. And whenever, or uh, whatever, in Matthew 19, uh, Verse 4, the Lord Jesus said, Whatsoever God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Man has no right to put asunder, to break up and to destroy what God has put together when God seals a wedding a ceremony. Christian marriage is a one-time act. <laughs> not two times and three times and four times. Never intended to be repeated in this life. It's for better or for worse. And you better believe it. Uh, it's for sickness and health. You better believe it. It's until death do us part. You better believe it. Uh, that's what it's all about. And so, uh, short of death of one or the other of the mates, uh, it is like the blood covenant of the Bible. And God says it cannot be changed. It must be related that way. And so all of these divorce courts that have been set up uh, until, until you have the one condition in the Bible that relates to it, and that's when a uh, the unfaithfulness of one of the members of the family go off and commit fornication with another person, uh, then, then you see uh, they must stay together. In this country today, you can get a divorce from saying, I just don't like you anymore. And God says that is not right. God's protection, even against the unbeliever. It says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, it says, Be ye not unequally yoked uh, together with unbelievers. Uh, there are specific reasons because sex has to do with spiritual things and, and has to do uh, with our soulical parts as well as our physical parts. So he says you don't want to unite a believer and an unbeliever together because when you do, you're having trouble. Well, what fellowship with righteousness with unrighteousness? It shows you the interrelationships of sex, you see, uh, that it has to do with the spirit of man on the inside of him. And what communion with light and darkness? And what concord with Christ and Belial? Or uh, what part hath he with believers and with infidels. And so God is very specific in saying that when it comes to marriage, he wants protection for the believer. And, and it is not correct for an, a person that loves God to go and marry a person that doesn't love God. And you're breaking the laws of God when you do it, and you'll find yourself in great trouble, great problems, great sorrows, great heartaches, 
when you deliberately rebel against the laws of God. God has protections in many avenues of sex. One is he has protection for the neighbor's wife. And you're a neighbor to someone, and so he has protection for your wife. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, he says, And thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. He has a nice house. You're not supposed to covet it. He says, And thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. She may be as beautiful as a doll, and yours might be very common looking. You found out after you married it for a while. And, and he says, Still, you shouldn't covet her. Leave your neighbor's property alone, whether it be a house, or whether it be cattle, or whether it be servants, or whether it be his wife. Leave them alone. They are private property. And if you do that, you can live long on this earth, and you can be a happy person. And Proverbs says it this way. And Proverbs 6 and 27 says, Can a man take fire in his bosom, and his clothes not be burned? Now, if you do the wrong thing, you're going to get burned. Now, you better believe it. <laughs> if you don't believe it, you're going to miss God. He says, Can one go upon hot coals, and his feet not be burned? God's talking to you, you see. So he that goeth in to his neighbor's wife, Whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. Now, here's some, <laughs> you know, you might have heard uh, what some perverted kid told you about sex. You may have heard what some school teacher told you that uh, your inhibition should be released and relaxed and do as you please. And you might have gone to some adult movie house and, and seen some very dirty stuff. But now God is speaking on the subject. And when God speaks, uh, we ought to listen. In these lessons, I'm going to give you a minimum of 50 things that God says about sex. If you didn't know the Bible said so much about it, it says everything about it. Everything about it. There's nothing left unsaid about it. The only thing that a lot of preachers don't have the courage to say it. And, and they think that sex is something dirty that you shouldn't talk about. And this is not true. It's holy. It is pure. God made it. God performed the first wedding ceremony. And God blessed the first kids that were born. And he's still blessing them that's born today. And, and so it's something that God loves and cares for. And he protects it. And, 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 and these are the ways that he does protect it. In Deuteronomy 22 and verse 22, it says, If a man be found lying with a woman married to an husband, uh, they, they, they shall both of them die, both the man that lay with the woman and the woman, so shall they put away evil from Israel. Now, God planted capital punishment for this sin. You may say, oh, it's just a little fun to go and have some sex. God says capital punishment. You die because of it. You say, why? You're dealing with immortality. You're not dealing with marbles. <laughs> uh, you're, you're not dealing with pancakes. You're dealing with the creatures that can never die. From the, the, from the sex act, we bring into being immortal souls that live forever. You can't play with things that important. You just can't play with things that are important. You must realize that they're sanctified in the eyes of God. And if we trespass against them, we violate all the whole personality of God. In 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 8, it says, Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Twenty-three thousand people in Israel were destroyed in one day, and the Bible says fornication. They just didn't treat the sex act as they should have. And they didn't res respect God as they should have. And 23,000 uh, of them fell in God, destroyed them in one day. I'm afraid Americans have not been taught the truth about sex. They've only been taught the excitement of it. They've only been taught the glamour of it. And they haven't been taught the truth of it. And God at this moment is trying to get across His Word. Because His Word is final and His Word works. In the book of Numbers, chapter 11 and verse 4, it says, And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. The mixed multitude, you know, the people that are carefree, the people that don't believe in, in, in doing things properly. They, they were a mixed gang. They were not all true believers. And it says, The children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? A mixed multitude is a dangerous thing. When you've got people that are willing to do anything, uh, you're, you're having your problems. God also protects a nation in relation to sex. In Leviticus 18, verse 24, God speaks to the whole nation and says, Defile not yourselves in these things, for in all these things the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. Now, God cast out, the, you know, the, the, the people that lived in those lands before the people of Israel uh, for doing these things. He displaced whole nations. He let nations be destroyed because of it. 
It says, For all these abominations have the men of the man done, which were before you, and the, and the land is defiled. You defiled the country. America is defiled because of sex transgression at this hour. All these divorces and all this imp impurity in our land, and, and, and it, has, it has defiled the country. The Bible says, God says. He says that the land, and he says that the land spew you not out of when ye defile it, as it spewed out the nations that were before you. For whosoever shall commit any of these abominations, even the souls that commit them shall be cut off from among their people. Now, you see, this is a much bigger situation than you ever dreamed. It's, it's a greater thing than you, than you realize. The sex act is it, not just something casual. It has to do with your, your life, your living. And when you transgress against it, God says you should be cut off from your people. He says if a nation does it, he will spew the nation out. So America will have to be destroyed. That's right. We, we will have to suffer. More than we have ever known to suffer as a nation. Because God said if you, if you violate the, 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 the holiness of sex, then you must suffer for it. All the nations in Palestine which practice illicit sex were destroyed because of this sex sin. And, and God warned that he would spew them out. And the, the Hebrew word there is gaya, which means vomit. He says, I'll vomit you out. Can you see how God feels about it? I hope that you can see. There was a name, man named Balaam in the Bible, and Balaam wanted to destroy Israel, and he couldn't do it on the battlefield, and he thought up a way. He says, the way to destroy them is through sex. And he says, get them to commit whoredoms with the women of the Mennonites. And he went and did that. In Numbers uh, chapter 31 and verse 15, it says that they kept the women alive of, of, of the Mennonites and that through the counsel of Balaam to transgress against the Lord, uh, there came a plague upon the congregation because of it. Right through to the whole Bible, it speaks about that. Right through to the book of Revelation chapter 2 and verse 20, it says that there were people that had the doctrine of Balaam even in the New Testament church, and it says who taught Israel to commit fornication. Now you can see that God is restrictive regarding sex. Why don't we read the Bible and study the Word of God and live the way God would have us to live? Well, C Broadcasting is privileged to bring you these life-changing messages by Dr. Lester Summerall. If you found today's teaching valuable, please consider supporting one or more of these programs and have your name added as a sponsor. Call the number on the screen to find out more. I'm Pete Summerall, and thanks for watching.